the votes that were counted after 3 a.m. on election night somehow had to be fraud, fraudulent and, and phony votes from dead people because they just suddenly came in. Well, everybody knew where they came in. They came in from the absentee ballots that had to be counted after the election. Um, this, he thought, would get him into the Supreme Court because he thinks that by appointing three people to the Supreme Court and having a so-called Republican or conservative majority on the court, that was going to do it for him and that would keep him in because his view was he took care of them, he rubbed their backs, they're going to rub his back. The U.S. Supreme Court does not work that way. This is exactly what people thought was going to happen during Watergate when Nixon was contesting his tapes. There were members of the Supreme Court, most of whom were appointed by Republicans or as a conservative majority. It was unanimous again. They ordered him to turn over those tapes. The fact is that Supreme Court justices have a duty to the Constitution. They abide by the rule of law. And that's what happened then. And that's what happened now. And, and, and I just because with this government uh, po political media nexus, we got a lot of misrepresentations. Suddenly, we were told before the election there would be no stimulus when lives and livelihoods were in danger. After the election, it, it's going to sail through. Suddenly, before the election on October 16th, Pfizer said, you know, we were going to make a big announcement. Here it is. We don't want to play politics. Uh, about whether the vaccination is useful or safe. Suddenly, two weeks later, six days after the election, a little bit, oh, it's safe and, it, and it's, we're going to use it. And by the way, we didn't have anything to do with Operation Warp Speed, which was untrue. And then when you get into Eric Swalwell, we, we knew, we being the government and the investigatory agencies, knew months before the election that he had been compromised, and yet suddenly we don't know this until after the election. And when you put Antifa and BLM that were rioting and looting and, and doing this all summer and creating this, this landscape of chaos, and then suddenly a week or so they magically dissipated and they still are for the most part and that creates a suspicion among the electorate they say why were all these things kept and what's the pattern and the pattern is the media has fused with the progressive agenda and the bureaucratic state that sounds conspiratorial but we didn't get all the facts necessary to make the to make the proper judgment we didn't have enough criteria and yet this president may enter office the most eth ethically compromised and the most legally vulnerable of any president that we've seen in our lifetime. And it's very ironic so because what there was a hubris and arrogance about Joe Biden that Donald Trump was the one who was guilty of mm -hmm. collusion when he had been the most investigated president in history. And he had never been, there wasn't even a hint that he'd done anything wrong with Russia. And the entire time, this truth was sitting right be before all of our eyes, and we were deliberately and willfully blind. It, it's a disgrace in a way. It really is. You would see those Republicans begin to evolve and try to find their way to a post-Trump era. I think what we're seeing is Republicans today, untethered from Donald Trump, but independently acting in this way. And, and my concern as somebody who's made this personal journey, but as everybody else has observed it, I'm afraid of what happens if Republicans regain control. Truly, Joy, I mean, this yeah, moment that, is the defining moment. It's an inflection moment for Republicans where we see who they are untethered from Donald Trump. And it, it that's concerns right. me, and I have a fear of them returning to power. Uh, and, and, well, I will ask you this final question, uh, Attorney General um, uh, Call. Is there any action that the state, that your state, could take? Um, you know, there are people are filing lawsuits left and right. Donald Trump has filed 56 lawsuits so far. Is, I mean, it's, maybe it's a waste of money at this point to spend the taxpayers' money to, to get retribution against these other states that are attempting to steal votes in your state. Is there any retribution? Is there any consequence that will happen uh, to those elected officials who've tried to steal the votes in your state? Well, today's ruling made clear that states can't sue other states to try to interfere with their election processes. That's a good thing. That was one of the arguments that we made and that other states made. But I do think it's critical that we take this opportunity to recognize how important it is that we protect our right to vote. And so I hope that we will see uh, legislation that uh, re reconstitutes voting rights act and strengthens it. I'd like to see a constitutional amendment expressly providing for the right to vote. And I would like to see federal legislation that ends partisan gerrymandering.
it, it would, it, that would all be nice, and I'm, I'm pretty sure all of that is on the desk of one Mitch McConnell, who won't move anything, including COVID relief. Uh, thank you, Wisconsin Attorney General Josh Call, David Jolly, Tiffany Cross, who, by the way, we are excited about your show. Be, be sure to turn in, tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern for the premiere of Tiffany's brand new show, The Cross Connection. It's right here on MSNBC. Don't miss it. And up next on the readout, Trump demands credit for the vaccine, while the White House is reportedly making threats, threats to the head of the FDA. And my friend Rachel Maddow is here on her brand new book, Bagman. It's about Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, who resigned in disgrace. He was Trump before Trump. Back with more The Readout after this. All right, Al Roker, thank you. As we've seen in all these months of suffering, the coronavirus does not discriminate, even taking the lives of those who fought so hard to save others. Joe Fryer now on One Doctor's Tragic Battle. Dr. Carlos Arajo Preza spent most of 2020 battling COVID, first as a pulmonologist on the front lines. Full force, like he, he never stopped. Then as a patient. It's an indiscriminate virus. It doesn't matter. Paige King was a nurse practitioner in Dr. Carlos's professional practice and a loving partner in his personal life. She saw him care for the sickest of the sick in the Houston area until late October when he got sick. He was a healthy man with no, you know, no, nothing against him. Yet the virus attacked his lungs, then later shifted to his brain, a rare but serious COVID complication that ended the doctor's life. We're broken. I don't even know how to move on. He also leaves behind two children. I honestly don't think that I have really come to accept. You know, like I feel like I, I haven't reached the level of acceptance that he's gone for real. Daughter Andrea says her father was born in El Salvador, came to America in the 90s to become a doctor. And we represent what he has instilled in us and his values. And we are so thankful to have had him as a father. Leonore Quiroz is thankful too. Though COVID took her husband's life, she credits Dr. Carlos with saving hers. He was making sure we were all okay and then all of a sudden he, he passes. He won his angel wings. He's up in heaven. An angel to so many. Joe Fryer, NBC News. We'll take a break in just 60 seconds how the COVID vaccine will be tracked and we fact check the rumor that it will be tracking you. If you have activity is taking place, still falling as rain along Interstate 80, but that's going to be transitioning very quickly over to that snowfall. And we're already seeing some pretty moderate snowfall taking place across portions of North Central. Mid 30s, the middle part of the week, a little warmer the end of the week and the weekend. For the PRA, could see some flurries, little or no accumulation on Tuesday, otherwise dry. Warmer Thursday and Fridays, back to the drug companies don't have to deliver on these kinds of time frames. It really is impressive that this kind of thing didn't happen with either of the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer, BioNTech, or Moderna. So as we've mentioned also, there was some trouble with AstraZeneca and the initial doses were confused that they were giving out to patients in their trials and now they might have to redo some of that. Does that mean that they're likely going to have to do a whole nother set of trials before that could be ready? Well, we're going to have to see. We, you know, the, the main trial in the U.S. of the original dosing scheme is still ongoing. It's not clear whether those results are really statistically different or whether it was the amount of vaccine or how long. But yes, it, it's a potential delay. It's not great news. The efficacy of the dose that, that was being tested originally was a little more than 60 percent, which would have been good if we hadn't just heard about the Pfizer and Moderna results. So I guess it should be said that, as you were mentioning, delays should be expected. That's a normal part of the process. But there had been incredible hopes that some of these vaccines might be available sooner than now may be in reality. That is a, a big problem. The ones that are most effective are not the easiest vaccines to make. Uh, and that's going to be a real, uh, a real problem. And they're also not the easiest vaccines to distribute. The Pfizer-BioNTech one in particular needs to be kept super cold. And that's going to make it hard to get those from one place to another. And it's going to be hard to make enough. You know, look, the Sanofi-Glaxo vaccine, that was going to be a billion doses next year. 
Uh, that's a big hit in the total number of doses available. The AstraZeneca vaccine was the easiest one to make and was the one that was going to be without profit distributed around the world. So it's it's not great news that those are moving more slowly than the mRNA vaccines, than Moderna and Pfizer. Help me understand what, what might be confusing to some people watching this. If we have Moderna and Pfizer more or less in hand, and those seem to be very effective vaccines, why do we need all these other ones? Well, the, the simplest answer is we don't have enough, even for the U.S. Uh, you hear the numbers sound bigger they are, remember, because you need two doses of each. And you shouldn't assume that every dose that's made is going to make its way into an arm, just like with anything else. There's going to be things lost in transport. And so we need more volume. Um, there also may be advantages to some of these other vaccines in terms of who they work for and how, which is one reason to develop more of them. But the big, the big answer is just that we don't have enough. All right, Matthew Herper of Stat News, thanks for helping us wade through all of this. Thank you so much. Let's turn now to the impact of COVID's resurgence in many states and take a look at how it's hitting California hard, despite the state's earlier success. California broke new records with the virus this week, leading officials to order new restrictions in more than 90% of the state, at least until December 28th. Only pay. Medical condition, including but some Nice. Registered dietitian Tiffany Kronkstad, who is also Dexter's daughter, says backing this Texas-led bill. So, bill, uh, bid, I should say. So, uh, let me start with you, too, Congressman Gates. What's your reaction to this news tonight from the Supreme Court? Well, the true casualty of the court's decision is an erosion of the power of state legislators to make election law. The principal challenge offered by Texas was that there were changes that were made not by the state legislators, uh, that instead were made by other officials that might not have been vested in that power. So that's deeply disappointing to us. And, you know, the context here is that if the state of Georgia, for example, were polluting a river that, were flow that was flowing into Florida, the Supreme Court would have original jurisdiction. And our argument is that if Georgia is polluting ballots, if they are polluting our election process with bad procedures, then the court similarly ought to take that up. Now all eyes are on January 6th. I suspect there will be a little bit of debate and discourse in the Congress as we go through the process of certifying electors. And we still think that there is evidence that needs to be considered. Remember, this is not a case of the Trump campaign failing to produce evidence. It's a failure of any court to exercise jurisdiction sufficiently to allow us to produce evidence. Oftentimes these motions to dismiss have been granted on the sufficiency of the pleadings, not on the sufficiency of the evidence. And the People's House may be the last forum available for us to make those arguments. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it appears on the face of it, Congressman Waltz, uh, the kind of case that the Supreme Court would want to look at yeah. when the legislature in Pennsylvania is, is designated as the body that will set the rules of an election and really sets a high bar for how to change any of the rules of the election. And then they get big-footed by the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, it, it, it seems as though that would be something that the Supreme Court would would see that they would want to weigh in on. Why do you think that they decided not to? Well, and Justice, uh, Justices Alito and Thomas uh, said they would have heard it. But, you know, this is a case, and, you know, so many in the mainstream meeting, the pundits and others, I guarantee you, have not even actually read the brief. It raises yeah. clear constitutional issues. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court overriding uh, the Pennsylvania State Legislature. The Georgia Secretary of State entering into kind of a deal with the Georgia Democratic Party over the state legislature. Real issues on the 14th Amendment, the uh, Equal Protection Clause, Article 1, all of those pieces. But yet, because Congressman Gates and, you know, a, a, what, a quarter of the Congress, uh, almost half of our attorney generals, agree with those constitutional issues... Uh, we now have, uh, you know, I've been called a coward, dangerous, uh, uh, disloyal to the Constitution. You know, <laughs> Martha, I've served in places that don't have court systems in Africa and Afghanistan and others. 
Uh, you know, we're essentially trying to, to, to settle this in the courts, as Al Gore did, as others did, uh, and that's the job of what, last I checked, the judiciary is a co-equal branch of government, and we have lawyers trying to resolve this peacefully, but we're not seeing that from the other side. Yeah, um, and I know that the Orlando Sentinel pulled their endorsement of you. They said that they didn't realize, they had no way of knowing that you were not committed to democracy. Do you want to respond to them? Yeah. Well, I think multiple tours in Afghanistan, uh, 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 Africa, and others shows my commitment. I've raised my hand to the Constitution, and now I've tried to further that service, uh, serving in the Republic. M me and so many others that are also signed on to this have lost body parts, lost loved ones, and fought to defend. Uh, so you know what, Orlando Sentinel, you can keep your endorsement. I don't need it. Uh, and all of the bipartisan things that we've worked on that they endorse, I guess, are tossed out when you disagree with the mainstream media. I'm not dangerous. Congressman Gates isn't dangerous. A media that is so in the bag for the other side and has stopped reporting the news is what's dangerous for this country. Important that it goes forward, that they continue to study it and, and make sure that there aren't problems that you don't see when you're only vaccinating, you know, 60,000 people. Something very, very rare. Uh, sure. You really need to to wait until it's in millions of people. But I, I think you know it is really important that that prominent people get this vaccine and do so publicly. But I think that the way this is really going to take off is is a lot of people. Uh, it, it's kind of grassroots, more of a community organizing approach where where someone will get this vaccine and will talk to their friends and their family, and it's going to take off mm -hmm. that way because this is. I mean, this can be a lifesaver for, for communities. And when you when you look at the people who've been hit the hardest by this, black Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, that's where you see the biggest amount of vaccine distrust and hesitancy because of, 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 yeah. of uh, historical racism and mistreatment and experimentation. And that's gonna be hard to, uh, to overcome. But it, it will be really important that trusted voices for every community stand up get their questions answered, and when they come to the conclusion that they want to get vaccinated, that they share that information so that people can get protected. Well, and, and the last thing is that I am one of those people that worries a little bit that just the news of a vaccine will make people relax. Can you just reiterate, I mean, this isn't happening for everybody next week. It's happening down the road in the spring, early summer. So shouldn't we be doubling down? If you could just, just talk to the people here about what we should be doing in the interim. Yeah, Joy, this is this is my biggest fear that people are going to hear this exciting news about a vaccine and say it's over. We can finally we can have a party. We right. can get together. We don't need to do these things. And it's just the opposite. This vaccine. Yes, it's going to help those people who get vaccinated, but it's not going to change what's going on in our communities. It's not going to protect people. We need to wear masks. We need to social distance. We need to w w wash our hands. And Congress needs to stand up and do their job. They need to put money in people's pockets. They need to protect people from eviction and, and mortgage foreclosure. They've got to expand unemployment insurance. They've got to give people sick leave and family medical leave. If, if, we, if they don't do that, then we are going to see the same kind of devastation in communities of color this winter that we've been seeing in this pandemic so far. And it doesn't have to be. I mean, this is this is absolutely critical. And, and I, I worry that just the joy of, of, of having this vaccine is going to lead people to, to, to step back a little bit yeah. from those things that really have to happen. A wide uh, telehealth network that allows the patients to also receive their care through telehealth. A lot of our psychiatrists are actually doing their consults through telehealth. Full kind of... And slow PCR is not for a virus that moves across multiple people within a week. This is an HIV. We want to tell you the story of a Christmas classic performed differently this year, but with a message as meaningful as ever. With that, here's Kevin Tibbles. It's been a Scrooge of a year. Oh, humbug. The ghosts of Christmas have haunted Chicago's Goodman Theater for more than 40 years, until the pandemic hit. Christmas Day? The show does go on this season, but as an audio version, free to all online. It was hard and sharp as flint. Across the pond in England. Keep Christmas in your own way. The great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens also performs and streams A Christmas Carol. A tale that rings as true today as it ever did. There is always hope. 
that there is hmm. always that, that chance of redemption at, at, at the end of the story. And the manual theater entertains with a puppet version, modernized for these trying times. The message really is to uh, reach out to other people around you, to check on other people around you, um, and to be generous and empathetic. As always, curmudgeonly Scrooge discovers the joy of kindness. Merry Christmas. Let's all hope the ghost of Christmas next year is more kind to all of us. God bless us, everyone. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Chicago. That's nightly news for this Friday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Dateline tonight. Evil takes over. Of, ...of people in this country. But if you are unmasked and you are infected and you encounter people who have not already had this virus, you will infect them. That conference shows just how virulent this virus is and why it's so important going forward in the next several months to continue our vigilance, mask up, and when it's your turn, vax up, get vaccinated. This virus will, you know, will continue to spread until we put it down. Thank you both very much. And next, more on the Supreme Court and its rejection of Trump's attempts to invalidate millions of votes. And Sarah Palin on the campaign trail again, rallying Republican voters for that crucial rough election in Georgia. Georgia, we need you to not just show up January 5th, not just win, but to crush it. Will that message be heard? For his Buzz Lightyear, then our Wonder Woman week of exclusives brings us Chris Pine's mysterious return. Love saves the day. And Super Direct theater was delayed by COVID, it is finally open to the public. COVID delayed the restorations to the theater, which was supposed to open in spring. COVID is still a factor for moviegoers, but the state theater is doing its best to make sure everyone is safe. When buying a ticket, the seats next to, in front of, and behind that ticket will not be in use. There will also be cleaning after each movie. Everyone watching the movie must be wearing a mask unless they are eating or drinking. With these precautions, the executive director of the State Theater, Allison Whalen, is excited for people who experience the historic theater. This theater has been many different colors. It's, you know, it went with the trends of the 70s and the 50s. Um, a lot of people in the community haven't seen it like it was supposed to be, you know, presented with the stencil work and um, all the ornate plaster. I mean, it's, I think it's really just amazing that we're here and we've accomplished this and it's taken the whole community's support to bring it back to life. For the first movie, they're showing White Christmas with more showings this weekend, along with Home Alone and uh, Paradiso, or Cinema Paradiso. Sam and Kelsey, back to you. Developing here on Dakota News Now at 6.30, the United States Supreme Court has rejected a lawsuit to overturn President-elect Joe Biden's victory. The lawsuit sought to invalidate millions of votes in the battleground states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, and Wisconsin. The court wrote, quote, the state of Texas's motion for a leave to file a bill of complaint is denied for lack of understanding under Article 3 of the Constitution. Texas has not demonstrated a judicially recognizable interest in the manner in which another state conducts its elections. All other pending motions are dismissed as moot. Stay with Dakota News now for further updates. Time now for a first look at our forecast with meteorologist Tyler Roney. Folks heading out to the State Theater tonight. It's not too bad, just a little cool out there. Yeah, I mean, so far it's been really quiet, even though it has been a little bit cooler the last few days. I mean, we're really getting kind of spoiled even yet tonight. You know, because not too far away, it is actually snowing, something that we haven't talked about in what feels like several weeks. Some of the cloud cover right now on First Alert Live Doppler. ...services so we can go back and take it to our enemies. Mark Pogmaropoulos, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick.
The effects of mass incarceration in this country are felt by many more people than those convicted of crimes. Student Reporting Labs, which is our journalism training program, explores how the criminal justice system can create obstacles for kids and families. It's part of our series, All This Week, Searching for Justice. It's estimated that nearly half of all U.S. children have at least one parent with a criminal record. And for the families, the negative effects of incarceration continue far beyond time served. 17-year-old Excellence Glenn's father was released from prison in 2005 following a conviction from drug and firearm possession. But the family had a hard time finding a home last year. More than once they were all set to move, only to find out their rental application was denied. How did it feel to pack up all that stuff and then unpack, repack, and figure out your living uh, situation? It was kind of hard. Because where we was before, it was kind of packed together since we was a big family. And um, we were hoping to move somewhere bigger. Excellence mom, Sheena Mead, was hesitant to tell her kids the real reason things weren't working out. We met all the financial requirements. Uh, credit was great. We always paid our, our rent on time. But there was something that was preventing us from getting the, home, the homes we wanted. That something was her husband Desmond Mead's criminal record. On the application says, have you ever been um, arrested or convicted of a felony conviction? And you have to check that box. But by this time, Desmond had become a successful lawyer and a prominent activist. Last year, he was named as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world for leading an effort in Florida to restore voting rights to over 1.4 million people with past felony convictions. Sheena says the whole family has been a part of that work, advocating for reforms to the criminal justice system, but the rental applications kept getting denied. And so we'll come home to have to tell the kids, well, this house didn't go through after all the excitement, or this house didn't go through. And the ironic thing about it, it was right after myself and the children we had celebrated, Desmond had got his uh, his own day. The mayor and the commissioner had uh, deemed Orange County Desmond Mead Day, which is September 10th. Looking back on that and looking at the work you do, how does that feel? Like, are you angry at that? Uh, it always gets me upset. It makes me more upset when I think about other people who are not as fortunate or doesn't have the time or the resources to take all that time and keep going back and forth. Sheena says they finally got approved for a place after she went directly to the owner of a home they were interested in and shared a letter about the family, along with press clippings showing all their accomplishments. No one should have to do that to have affordable or safe housing, but that was our reality. Excellence wants other kids to know there's no shame in having a parent with a criminal record. Some kids, they don't really want to talk about it. They think that it's bad. Um, they feel embarrassed, but it's not something you should be embarrassed about. Not only are people prevented from voting, they're prevented from finding homes and houses and living where they want freely because of the system. I think that could have been a missed opportunity to really talk to our children and that's what I'm hoping that others are hearing from this is like let's not miss those opportunities to inform and educate our community and our families instead of shying away from it. For the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs, I'm Mary Williams. As another week of this devastating pandemic comes to an end, we take a moment now to honor some of those we've lost to COVID-19. Guadalupe Perez had an entrepreneurial spirit and a knack for cooking. He spoke little English when he left Mexico for the United States in the 90s. He started a business selling raspados or frozen ice Every summer, the 62-year-old greeted long lines of customers in Chicago, eager to try his bold flavors. Generous and thoughtful, Guadalupe always shared whatever he had with others, his son said. He offered food or jobs to friends in need. And for his five children, he worked tirelessly and spared no expense to help them succeed. Hello. Pawn Sim Hildebrand loved to laugh and be silly, especially with her children and grandkids. Her son said she made it easy for people around her to relax. A hard worker with a green thumb, 
Pawn turned her home vegetable garden into a successful business and was a founding vendor at the Columbia Farmers Market in Missouri. She was also a leader in her church and even at 71 woke up at 5.30 every day for the morning service. 77-year-old Paul J. Foley Jr. felt a responsibility to give back to his country, his daughter said. He was a lieutenant in the Army and served in the Korean demilitarized zone. Most recently, he worked as an elections judge in Chicago. Family was the center of Paul's life. He taught his kids the importance of service. And it was important to him that everyone's voice was heard. His loved ones knew him as a risk taker, who loved to be silly and greeted everyone with a smile. Pharmacist Ed McFall spent more than a half century fighting to bring better health care to small towns like the one he grew up in. His work took him to Oklahoma City, where he served on the board of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. A former governor, David Walters, said he was struck by Ed's knowledge and, quote, compassion for rural health. His career also brought him to his wife. The couple reconnected at a pharmacy convention and were engaged within a week. The 76-year-old father and grandfather spent his free time fishing, traveling in his RV, and driving his boat on the lake. 64-year-old Keith Jacobs had an artistic eye, his son said. Keith was a photographer who loved capturing human emotions and would tell everyone to have a picture-perfect day. Funny, witty, and kind, he was dedicated to his family above all else. Known by his loved ones as a simple man, Keith would often tell his daughter, make sure you're a good person first, then catch your dreams. And as always, we want to thank family members for sharing these stories. Our hearts go out to you as they do to all those who've lost loved ones in this pandemic. Uh, made $25 last night. Um, that tells you right there. We usually make thousands of dollars a night down to $25. How am I supposed to pay my staff? How are we supposed to pay um, you know, our bills? Uh, it's just not for us. Um, this is affected, uh, closing the outside dining program has affected the single moms that we hire, the single dads. It, it affects the bar owners that had to put all this money into a uh, food concept. Um, uh, Enrique at Retro Junkie has uh, joined in with me and we're in a, quite a few other restaurants now. I've got, I hear stories every day, they're calling the, my uh, restaurant and they're pleading with me to, to help them. And I decided to take the charge and we definitely need to do something because we're all hurting, we're losing money every day. How are we supposed to pay the bills? How are we supposed to do anything when there's no proof, no data that this is affecting the hospital stays and the COVID-19 uh, push that they're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, we've learned a lot, and uh, the science is pretty clear. According to all of the top officials at the task yes. force, that outdoor dining is the safer option and that uh, all of you all have made these adaptations to be able to do it. Corey and Patty, good luck to you both. Uh, we all yes. hope to visit your establishments oh, when they open back up again. Hang oh, in there. Uh, hopefully this vaccine is going to start to make thank a difference. You. Thanks, you guys. Great to see you tonight. Be well. So joining me now, Dave Rubin, host of the Rubin Report, and Charlie Leduff, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and host of the No BS News Hour podcast. Great to see you both. Uh, Dave, let me start with you. You know, Corey's business in California, when uh, you heard what I said about Gavin Newsom's businesses getting over a million dollars in the PPP programs, what do you say to these, uh, these restaurant owners? What goes through your mind when you listen to them? Well, I really feel for them, and I'm not just saying it like talking head on cable news saying it. I, I've been out here at the protests in L.A. I still live in L.A. I'm not quite sure why at this point, because uh, it's not even that warm out right now. But, you know, these people, uh, they are following the American dream of taking a chance on doing something that gives you purpose and passion and a reason to live and allows you to put food on your family's plate and all of that stuff that is so great about this country and has been great for over 200 years 
And government officials, Gavin Newsom, who has no problem going to French Laundry, one of the most expensive restaurants in the United States, with 21 other people, not social distancing, not wearing masks, indoors, racking up a $15,000 bar bill. I mean, I am not making this stuff up. That's what he's doing two weeks ago. And then our, our mayor here, Eric Garcetti, is protesting without a mask. And then they just decide to destroy businesses, absolutely destroy businesses. I think the average person is fed up. You know, when I go to these rallies, it's not just that it's that it's conservatives out there or, or right-wingers or Trump people. These are regular people who have been shocked by the system into waking up, and, and they've really had it, and with good reason. Pe people want to live. We're not hamsters that are supposed to be in a little cage for everybody to look at. Um, Charlie, the... Joined now by the host of the Rachel Maddow Show, author of... It's just, you listen to Patty, and I want to apologize to her because her shot was breaking up a little bit, so it was a little bit hard to hear her, but you could, you could hear in her voice what she's going through. And you see the vaccine around the corner and things continuing to be closed down in a new round. Yeah, uh, well, our governor likes to do it in like two, three week pieces, so you don't really get a clear projection of what you should do for the month. So we're closed down until mm -hmm. 19th, 20th. And then you're damn certain it's going to be through the new year. Okay. So just be honest with us and do yeah. it. What I would say about small business people is uh, they're taking the brunt of this when it was, I fully believe now the government completely screwed up. This week, I went around with body collectors and took the corpses out of the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Nothing's been done. All of this money that could have been injected into protecting the very old, who this is hitting in very controllable spots, we have not done. And if you want to know how long it took to plan and execute the invasion of Normandy, it was seven months. We're nine months into it. We're dying on the vine. And come spring, I think it's going to be holy hell. These places aren't coming back. So the thing that's so amazing about these two, you write in your book and you say it all the time, history is here to help, history is also here to freak us out. Because as I am reading through this book and dog-earing it and destroying it so no one else could ever get to read it, which is what I do to books, it's freaky. Spiro Agnew is basically a more articulate version of Donald Trump, attacking the press, the racism, the anti-Semitism, the saying, everybody loved me until I then uh, get to the White House and everybody hates me. The attacks, they're so symmetrical. They're so, and it's interesting to me because a lot of times you hear very smart people talk about what Trump is trying to do to undermine democracy right now and the way that he plays very fast and loose with the with authoritarian trend lines and, and all the stuff that he pushes at. And a lot of smart people will say, well, yeah, this is buffoonish and this is obviously going to fail and it's easy to laugh at Trump doing these things. But what about when the slicker version of Trump comes around, the more articulate version, the less ham fisted version of Trump comes around and tries to do these things. And history is here to remind us that actually that already happened. Agnew was pushing all the same levers that Trump is pushing, but you're right. He did it in a way that was sort of erudite and erect and correct and um, articulate and he he still was seen as a crook and forced from office because of it. So it, it, it may, it's sort of comforting to me because there isn't really anything new under the sun. But the lesson of how to deal with guys like that is not that they go away on their own or not that they can be some sort of, sort of um, I don't know, neutralized by the passage of time. He was as malignant as Trump is, but there were good people in office who put country above party, who put duty above partisanship, and they fixed it. Trump judge, no Obama judge. There's only a rule of law in the United States Supreme Court, which people would say is ideologically six to three on the Republican side, resoundingly voted for democracy. Now is the time to move beyond this. I am not going to criticize the 18 folks who joined that brief. I'm going to ask them to do what President Lincoln urged the South to do after the Civil War. Let's get together and find this country's wounds and let's move forward in a way that first takes care of the pandemic and the people in the United States who are suffering as a result of it. Donald Trump is a footnote in history that will be seen as a bad footnote that will never go back to again. And let's talk about America. 
So, Attorney General, let me ask you, because obviously in your capacity as president of the National Association of Attorneys General, um, you know that you, you, you know all these folks, and 18 of your, your fellow attorney generals did sign on to the suit, right? Some and of my friends. Some of them your friends. Okay. And by the way, I want to make it clear, plenty of Republicans attorney general did not sign on, but 18 of them did. And they know the law. They know, I would presume, that, that this was ridiculous. Why do you think they did it? I think there's been unprecedented withering, coercion, and pressure, and threats by Donald Trump to pressure people to join. I think there's probably a handful or less than a handful who actually don't know the law and have been put in by our poor campaign finance rules to just be mouthpieces for, honestly, unbridled power. And those few, I'm not going to name them. It's time for you to leave the attorney general room. The overwhelming majority, come on back, work with us as we move this country forward. All right. Attorney General, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Attorney General Racine from Washington, District of Columbia. And next, what's Congress doing to help Americans who now, right this hour, don't have the money to pay the rent, don't have the money for food? There's millions and millions of Americans in this situation tonight. That's next. Now is the time to actually increase the fight, knowing that the Calvary is coming. Specifically, $1 billion in this next relief bill this week or next week. Your face is from the Obama administration. What do you make of, uh, of the, the, some of the senior picks he's made so far? Well, uh, Joe Biden has picked people he really knows. Uh, people he knows well. He spent a lot of time with Lloyd Austin in Iraq when he was vice president. Uh, he's picked Dennis McDonough for the VA, who, by the way, is one of the most fundamentally decent people I've ever covered in, in public life. Uh, these are, by and large, ve almost entirely very good people, but very familiar. Susan Rice over at, now at the domestic side. Uh, and so they're people he knows, he trusts, who will be ready on day one. Uh, and so it, it's, it is really Obama three you know, in that sense. I, I also share some of the concerns with Lloyd Austin, not for anything having to do with Lloyd Austin, Austin and his performance, but there's a reason we have this rule, this tradition, and also a rule, that you don't have generals switching right over to the defense secretary. It's about civilian control. It's about pe picking people who have distance from the current military brass. And that is a very solid and sensible rule. And in the Jim Mattis case, where we also had to get an exemption, that struck me as an extreme circumstance where getting Jim Mattis in there was so important, it was worth breaking the rule. No, there must be a lot of very qualified people like Michelle Flournoy who could be Secretary of Defense. I don't quite see why we run this risk uh, of traversing what is a sensible principle. And Mark, uh, what is your assessment of uh, some of these uh, uh, Biden, some of the main Biden picks so far? Well, Judy, I, I think in, in dramatic contrast to his predecessor, Joe Biden you know, was knocked by, uh, by his political opponents having spent 47 years in Washington. He knows these people. He's worked with them. He knows their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, if, if they turn out to be lemons, it's because Joe Biden picked them, uh, not because they were imposed upon him. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I really think that the strength of, uh, of the, the nominees uh, is, is that Joe Biden uh, certifies them, validates them. Um, and that's, that's the accountability of a, of a presidential leader. Um, and uh, on the on the whole, I I, I, I remain impressed by them. I, I, I would point out that any money that's left over uh, from the stimulus, uh, the, the, the the original uh, bailout and COVID, uh, will be in the stewardship of Janet Yellen as Secretary of Treasury. Um, and I, I think there's somebody who will spend it wisely and well and uh, and quite humanely. And on that note, we thank you both, Mark. You didn't get to watch. I think they doth protest too much, Kim Strassel. I, I mean, you, you know, the, the vehemence with which these uh, reporters shut this down, it, it uh, you know, keep walking, there's nothing to see here. I, I want to just play this montage, and then I'd love for you to, to jump in after we watch this. 
charge is so heinous, I'm not even going to say them. Talking about the Biden's personal corruption, a little bit about Hunter Biden, some, most of those charges unverified. This whole uh, smear on Joe Biden uh, comes from the Kremlin. Uh, peddling yeah. baseless conspiracy theories about Joe Biden and his son. It is so obviously a Russian operation. It is so obviously a story that was created by the Trump campaign. Kim Strassel, what do you say? Well, look, here's a remarkable thing about this, Martha, is that, you know, every once in a while, the press can maybe get a pass for missing a story or coming late behind someone else that really got a scoop. But this one was so glaringly obvious, so straight in front of them, that it's even harder to understand. Remember, go all the way back to the summer of 2019. There were media outlets writing about this, This because this was back before uh, they, they, they wanted Joe Biden to win. They, could, they didn't care if he lost the primary, so they were going after Hunter Biden. Um, and then they shut it down because we went into impeachment. We had all of the information that came out about Burisma in impeachment. That information continued all throughout the, the spring of this year. This fall, we had a report from Senators Ron Johnson and Chuck Grassley that laid out all of these problems. And then we had Hunter's former business partner. <laughs> and they nonetheless just go on and, and in the face of all of this, say Russian disinformation. It was one of the most disingenuous comments I have ever seen from the press corps. Uh, a press corps that at least in the beginning understood this was a story, but put that aside because they cared more about a political outcome in the end. Yeah, Kim makes a great point, Greg, because the, the narrative shifted when it became clear that Joe Biden was going to be the nominee here. That's when it really shut down hard. That's right. And this wasn't media incompetence. This was willful, Martha. This was deliberate. This was the worst uh, cover-up by the media in my lifetime. And it wasn't just the censorship by Twitter and Facebook. No. New York Times, The Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, they all refused to cover the story. They kept assuring the American public, there's nothing to report here, there's nothing to investigate. Jake Tapper uh, said to his audience, this story is so disgusting, I'm not going to report on it. As you point yeah. out, NPR saying, um, it's not a real story, it's only a distraction. It was so obvious all along to those of us who were reporting it and were mocked, ridiculed, and demeaned for doing so, mm -hmm. that there was a criminal investigation of Hunter Biden. We knew that when the subpoena was issued over his laptop. Uh, you know, subpoenas are issued by grand juries. That means there's a criminal investigation. Yet the media was in total denial because they were acting not only as advocates in the election of Joe Biden, but as his protector. It was irresponsible. It was shameful. Uh, it was media malpractice on steroids. And, and you know, these investigations are ongoing. They continue to carry on the investigation. The evidence gathering is continuing. So it's a story. Uh, we covered it. You know, a special report covered it um, and also got vilified for even mentioning it uh, in our programming. So, you know, Jessica, let me ask you this as Piers Morgan raises this question. He says, can you imagine the howls of outrage if Don Jr. had been under federal investigation for tax fraud, fraud and nobody told the voters? and the media looked the other way. Try to put yourself in that reality for just a second. What would you have said if, you, if, if that story was buried and it wasn't reported? Jessica, is Jessica hearing me okay? Ah, she froze. Um, Kim, your thoughts? <laughs> well, of course, it would have been out. There would have been absolute outrage. But this has been the double standard that we have seen all along. And look, what I want from my perspective, Martha, is cover all stories aggressively and equally. You know, if that were the case with Don Jr., I remember when everything started and the accusations about Russian collusion came along. You know, we at the editorial board of the journal, we at least kept our minds open to the possibility that that was there was something to that. CDC officials who were like, oh yeah, they told me to delete skeevy emails from Trump appointees. <laughs> you should know about that because that, what they told me to do, that's illegal. 
You've also got CDC scientists showing up again. Instead of being muzzled, they're turning up and talking to reporters, talking yes. to the public, speaking at advisory committees. And all of a sudden, yes. Trump gets voted out of office, even while he's still there. Their guidance is suddenly getting less stupid and more clear. Finally, CDC is like, yeah, when you're not in your house, wear a mask. They wouldn't let us say that before, but Trump's <laughs> on his way out. We're just saying it. You can see the CDC yeah. becoming the gold standard public health agency it's supposed to be yeah. once again. And it's all happened over the course of this week. It's revenge of the nerds, right? Like all of the science related agencies are back, baby. And they're like, no, we're going to fight this virus. He's on the way out. Evict him already. And let's get this going. I think that's a great answer. Unfortunately, on this show, I get to always win this game, so I'm going to overrule one of the best answers to who won the week that ever happened, and I'm going to say that I am decided that who won the week this week are our friends Tiffany Cross and Jonathan Capehart. I'm yeah, giving them yeah. who won the week because their show's debut this weekend. Uh, Tiffany Cross is the Cross Connection. Jonathan Capehart's the Sunday show. They debut this weekend, Saturday at 10 a.m., Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Everyone should be watching. I will be in my slippers, possibly in the bed with a cocktail, watching both of these shows. So I can't wait. Cross Connection and the Sunday show debut this weekend. So they won the week. But Rachel, you always win every every night. So thank you so and much I will, for being here. I will tonight. tell you, really Joe, that I am going to I am going to be on with John. Jonathan Capehart on his first show on Sunday. So I will see you then. Yes. And I will convey yes. to him your winning wishes. Please convey my winning wishes. And you know what? He also wins because he booked an incredible guest, Rachel Maddow. So I love it. The love fest <laughs> continues. You're great, Rachel. What an incredible book. Congratulations on Bagman. It is awesome. No one can borrow my copy because I've destroyed it with yellow mark and things and, <laughs> and dog earring it. But still read it. Thank you guys very much. For Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You Have a great show tonight. Thank okay. you, thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Tune in tonight. Thank you so much, Rachel. Tune in tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Rachel Matter Show. You guys do that anyway. That is tonight's readout. All in with Chris Hayes starts right now. Tonight on All In. No, it means you have to turn over the election. The Supreme Court of the United States will see it. And respectfully, hopefully, they will do what's right for our country. The Supreme Court did what was right for the country. Donald Trump's latest effort in his assault on democracy has been defeated. But what about all those Republicans who got on board? Tonight, Congressman Adam Schiff on what the decision means for the country and the grave danger of this moment, regardless of the court's findings. Classic epidemiology, they said. Okay. If you're starting to get the impression that dishonest people can easily manipulate data to tell you any story they want to tell you, you may be onto something. Consider the condition of our economy. The numbers out of Washington suggest it's in great shape. Stock prices, 401ks, upscale home sales have all risen dramatically. Try to buy an expensive exercise bike or a million dollar center console fishing boat. Good luck. In many cases, they're sold out. There are a lot more billionaires than there ever have been in this country. In fact, as a group, billionaires have increased their wealth by 30% overall this year. That's by more than a total of a trillion dollars in a single year. No precedent for that. At the same time, the unemployment rate is falling. You hear that a lot. So it's all good. As Joe Biden likes to say, we're building back better. Well, that's one way to look. This scam that the Democrats are pulling, it's a scam. The scam will be before the United States Supreme Court. And it won't. He wanted the court, his court, with his justices to settle this, and it did, just not in his favor. The three justices that he named to the court did not dissent from tonight's decision, and whether they saw it or not, their decision came shortly after the president tweeted, quote, if the Supreme Court shows great wisdom and courage, the American people will win perhaps the most important case in history, and our electoral process will be respected again. Again, no clue what, if anything, the justices made of that and all the rest of his tweets at them, nor what they made of this, other than not wanting to hear more on the subject. For President Trump to be ahead as far as he was at 3 a.m. in these four states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, and for the vote to swing by as much as it did, the probability of that in one state is one in one quadrillion. That's one comma 15 zeros. Uh, to happen in all four, it's one comma 15 zeros to the fourth power. Yeah, it's making that up. It doesn't make sense.
minority Republican lawmakers dissented from that kind of nonsense, including Senator John Cornyn of Texas, a former judge who said he did not see the theory of the case, and Senator Mitt Romney, who called it madness. Congresswoman Liz Cheney, who was the only one of four House leaders not to sign on to the Friends of the Court brief, 126 of her fellow Republicans did. A spokesman for President-elect Biden said the court's decision was no surprise, adding, quote, dozens of judges, election officials from both parties, and Trump's own attorney general have dismissed his baseless attempts to deny that he lost the election. A lot to talk about, starting with CNN political correspondent Abby Phillip, also CNN contributor, Nixon White House counsel John Dean. Now, keep in mind, this is stimulus money. It's designed to help those hurt by the lockdowns. And in many cases, it did help and it will help. But in many other cases, the money has gone to people with the right political connections. A voter registration nonprofit run by the Reverend Raphael Warnock, that's the left wing preacher now running for Senate in Georgia, raked in $482,000 in coronavirus bailout money. How did he do that? Don't ask. A firm that happens to be co owned by Ilhan Omar's husband got half a million dollars in tax money. Planned Parenthood hoovered up. $80 million. More abortions for everyone. The Kennedy Center in Washington, home to the local opera, got $25 million and then laid off employees anyway. Last week, we spoke to a man called Dave Morris. Morris owns a restaurant. And Republicans, the ones who like to wave around the Gadsden flag, the don't tread on me flag, the ones who parade around in tri-corner hats, waving the patriotic stars and bars of our founders who fought against British tyranny for self-rule. How should the American people react to the state, the government, invalidating the people's choice? How do you think they would react? What would have happened in this country if this lawsuit had won? I think it's pretty clear that if it had won, and again, it didn't, it lost, thank goodness, right? But if it had won, it would have represented the worst crisis for the country since secession. And I don't think that's an overstatement. It's not just me. This is part of an impassioned plea that Democratic Senator Chris Murphy made today. And think about the fact that these words needed to be spoken today on the floor of the United States Senate. Right now, the most serious attempt to overthrow our democracy in the history of this country is underway. Those who are pushing to make Donald Trump president for a second term, no matter the outcome of the election, are engaged in a treachery against their nation. You cannot, at the same time, love America and hate democracy. But as we speak, a whole lot of flag-waving Republicans are nakedly trying to invalidate millions of legal votes because that is the only way that they can make Donald Trump president again. Now, of course, legally, the lawsuit was complete garbage. Okay, garbage. The suit, sure. Everyone else will get the shaft. Who's everyone else? Well, regular wage earners, people living on fixed income, every middle class retiree in the country. In fact, anyone who bothered to live like a responsible person and save money, all of them will be in serious trouble when inflation arrives. I think you're absolutely right, Anderson. Uh, it's something he can't seem to accept. Uh, I don't think he's going to send Christmas party invitations to the court this year to have them come down. Uh, you know, I, it, it, we know we're dealing with a narcissist. We're de dealing with a man who's shown throughout that he can't take any kind of uh, negative attention or defeat or anything without constantly doubling, doubling down. Yeah. I wouldn't be totally surprised if he still tries to pull something off when the uh, Electoral College is selected and gets to counting the votes in the Congress. There are some things you can do there. They're highly irregular, but he likes highly irregular. John, the court did not provide a vote count, and, and there was not a formal dissent. Justices Alito and Thomas did add that statement, saying they believe the court did have jurisdiction to hear the case, but wouldn't grant any other relief. Can you just explain what they are saying there? Well, this is very, this is not unusual in, particularly in, in a case like this where there's original jurisdiction. They were staking out, the, those two justices, that, that that was firmly their belief that they should have taken the case, even if they didn't rule favorably on it. Uh, probably the most disappointing thing, Anderson, is about that brief per curiam, is we're at a very dangerous time in our democracy. 
I think the court could have spent a little of its reputational capital and issued a very brief per curiam opinion, maybe five pages, and said that what the president is saying is not true. There's no great injustice in this, in this election process. They've looked at it, and everything is going as it should go. And there's highly polarized, so that would have been some comfort to the millions of people who are worried about this process, that Trump has managed to get upset. So I'm disappointed they didn't issue a peculiar opinion. Yeah. John and Abby, stand by for, for a moment. I want to bring in uh, Dana Nessel, Attorney General from Michigan, one of the four states again vindicated tonight. Madam Attorney General, what is your reaction to the court's announcement? I'm relieved that they did the right thing. Uh, obviously, I'm happy that the 5.5 million people who voted in my state won't have their votes disenfranchised, and that the 10 million people who live in my state will be properly represented at the Electoral College. But the fact that we even find ourselves in this place where we have to be relieved that something ridiculous didn't occur, that should never have uh, occurred, you know, it's a, it's a sad chapter in American history that we really need to put behind us. And that so many in the Republican leadership has have gone along with this is it just it is it is insane. Do you believe the president's legal options now are truly exhausted, at least in courts? I mean, obviously, what happens when Congress gathers to count the electoral votes on January six, as John you know pointed out, could be another story. Honestly, I make no predictions about that because what we just saw happen uh, with the state of Texas having filed this case, this ludicrous, ridiculous case against my state and three others, that's something I never would have predicted. So it's hard for me to say, well, you know, we're done now. Uh, we have rounded the corner and absolutely we won't see any more shenanigans because that has continued to occur. But what I will say is this, we will continue to fight as vigorously as possible to ensure that the person who actually won the presidential election is sworn into office on January 20th. And that's what we all should care about, and that's what everyone should want to happen. What do you make it? Hey, capitalism itself will be discredited, and you don't want that. It's already happening. There are already an awful lot of socialists around these days. Have you noticed that? Why is that? Well, it's because the people in charge of our economy are discrediting our system. They are giving capitalism a bad name. Because what they're participating in is not a market economy, a free open market economy. It's a closed game run for their own benefit and their benefit alone. Long term, this is a disaster for all of us. And not even so far in the future. In four years, for example, Sandy Cortez will be eligible to run for president. Now, you may laugh at Sandy Cortez, and you should. She's a vacuous idiot, another rich girl narcissist with an overheated Twitter account. But that doesn't mean she couldn't win. If we keep up with this nonsense, this economic craziness, she could win. Ned Ryan is the CEO of American Majority, and he joins us tonight. Ned, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. So there's been Good this kind of agreement among think tank conservatives not to talk about growing income inequality because it abets socialism, that kind of talk. I would argue ignoring it is what's bringing us socialism. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the thing that, that frustrates me when many on the right don't want to call out this, I, I guess you call it a bastardized corporatist capitalism, because yes. it's not true, true free market capitalism. And I, I just, I, the, the thing is, you just have to look at history. Tucker, go back and look at the turn of the 20th century when the robber barons and, and those consolidated and rigged a system to benefit themselves, and we got the rise of progressivism, which gave us the right. administrative state and really started to do away with our constitutional republic. We're, re we're replaying the same thing, but we're allowing these people to rig the system. And you talked about the great consolidation of wealth, Amazon with 100% increase in profits, uh, Target, Walmart, 80%. As we're watching tens of thousands of small businesses go out of business and those that are staying alive, 30% reduction in revenue. And we're acting like we're not going to replay history. And I will say this, history tells us, Tucker, if the reaction to this abuse of, of crony capitalism and the robber barons was progressivism, the, the result of what we're seeing right now will be much, much worse, I believe, than progressivism. And you're right. People might want to laugh at AOC and the socialists, but when people look at this and think that somehow what we're seeing is true capitalism, the reaction will be a strong reaction against it. And God forbid, That's right. but th their answer is pure socialism. That's it. We're going to wind up like the Romanovs if we don't slow this down. 
So I don't understand exactly how. Right. It is right, and it's scary. It's not a joke. You look at AOC. I watch her all the time. I think, this woman's an idiot and a racist, totally self-discrediting, and she becomes more popular every year. Why is that? There's a re... Again, I'm really happy that the court skunked Donald Trump 9-0 to 0 and stood up for democracy. Let's heal this country. And then, Chris, if we want to talk about democracy from the District of Columbia, mm -hmm. let's talk about statehood and allowing the District of Columbia. And I know I've seen you interview my Congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton, many times. It's about time to give a city that, yes, has a history of having a majority African-American, and that's relevant here, populace, the right to have a voice in Congress. Statehood, taxation without representation, True democracy is what we should be focused on tonight. So well said, uh, Attorney General, for uh, the District of Columbia, Carl Racine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. During Donald Trump. I hate your couch. I'm one of a kind. There's no one like me. Does that make me lonely, being one of a kind? No, that makes me free. Laura, what? there were moans and groans, fart jokes and Trump impersonations. This was a total disaster. Morrison said his Grinch was uh, inspired by Joaquin Phoenix's performance Lovely. as the Joker. That is not a family film. The casual viewer might have thought they were watching Hustle and Flow in Chernobyl, okay? Viewers were mortified. They wrote a... A Democratic Party, meaning a party that believes in democracy versus an autocratic party. And we've never seen that. When you see that many members of Congress breaking faith with their oath to overturn an election because they don't like a result, we're off the reservation to a place that we might, might not be able to get back on it from. We're one election away from losing the country to people who no longer believe in democracy. An autocratic party, that's what the Republican Party has become. The Orlando Sun Sentinel editorial board has apologized for endorsing one of those 126 Republicans, Congressman Michael Waltz, writing, quote, we had no idea, had no way of knowing at the time that Waltz was not committed to democracy, end quote. Today, the Democratic Congressman Bill Pascrell is demanding that those House Republicans who wanted the election overturned not be seated in Congress. In a letter to Democratic leadership, Congressman Pascrell cites an amendment which prohibits anyone who, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion, end quote, from serving in office, writing, quote, stated simply, men and women who would act to tear the United States government apart cannot serve as members of Congress. Uh, we're going to... We're going to be back in just a moment with Mar uh, Masha Gessen, staff writer for the New, York, uh, the New Yorker and author of the book, Surviving Autocracy, to discuss this. We'll be right back. Republicans are using that uh, to say, well, they wouldn't even see it, and, they, and Alito and Thomas thought they should see it so that they could therefore rule on it. They saw it, and they made a ruling. Is this a procedural thing where the other folks said, you don't have the right to bring it? They said you have the right to bring it, but that doesn't mean we're going to side with you. Um, I, I, it's just nuts, Mark. Did 126 Republicans, the ones that signed on to this ridiculous lawsuit, did they follow, just essentially follow the president off of this crazy cliff? Yeah, sure. That, that's just a purity test for, uh, and a loyalty oath for uh, Trump supporters. But today was a a good day for prisoners of hope. They got out of jail on two fronts. We got the vaccine, the Supreme Court upheld the laws of the land. And it strikes me, Don, that a couple of things. One is, thank God we have an appointed Supreme Court, right? Imagine if they were elected and acted like the, 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 the representatives around the country did. And two, uh, even Democrats, I think, can be thankful for the Federalist Society who gave him a list of, of relatively recently experienced uh, justices. Because imagine... If, if he didn't have that list and he appointed who he really wanted to, we'd have Justices Pirro, DeGeneva, and Giuliani ruling on this case. So uh, at the end of the day, it's been a pretty good day. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, listen, when I said I can, I can see how they're going to twist themselves into a pretzel doing it, right? They're going to rationalize this. 
You saw it, Mark. You know. Well, am I wrong about that? They're doing it already. Oh, sure they are. And I, I, Don, I think they'll continue to do it right up until January 6th. And, uh, you know, they'll hold out. And they'll, they'll register some protest votes uh, uh, when, they, when they formally uh, endorse what the electors uh, have, have put forward. So, and, and beyond. And, and, you know, they're going to hold out. And, and, and that's going to help them in their Republican primaries as Trump continues to be like a shadow president. Uh, holding everybody in line. Kirsten, you, you, when you were on this program, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you made the point to me that uh, a lot of these Republican lawmakers aren't just supporting this far simply because they're afraid of President Trump. A lot of them really like him. So what happens after Trump mm -hmm. is out of, out of the White House? Well, I don't know. I do think he will continue to loom large over the party because, you know, they don't, they don't, I, you know, I think I was on Anthony Scaramucci and he said, well, nobody really likes him because he's not really that nice yeah, of a that's, person. That's but I, when I say somebody, right. like, when I, when I say someone likes a politician, I don't mean they want to be besties. I mean, they like what they're doing. And I think that a lot of Republicans who would say, oh, I'm only going along this, with this out of fear, I think a lot of them are are fearful of him, but I also think a lot of them, like the Trump supporters, like what he does. And, you know, they call it playing hardball, um, you know, or, or, or punching back, even though usually he's just punching. Um, and, and this is just, this is taking it to the extreme end of that continuum, which is to try to overthrow an election and try to, you know, upend democracy. I mean, this has been a very scary time for a lot of people. Uh, I, I think for, for a lot of people who've watched this and, and never thought they would see an American president doing something like this and that you wouldn't expect um, you know, people to be going along with it the way that they are. Yeah. Uh, uh, whoever's beeping, your, your microwave popcorn is ready and you can get to it now because this segment is over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate both of you. Be safe, it and I'll see you soon. Okay. So we're going to have more on our breaking news tonight. We have a lot of news tonight. The FDA issues an emergency use authorization for Pfizer's vaccine. Uh, and officials say Americans could start getting shots as soon as Monday. Stay with us. I created the Always Pan to make home cooking more joyful. 